Welcome to our fourth Universalist service video. My name is Ember Kelly. I'm the Director of Religious Education here at Fourth Universalist, and thank you for watching. What follows this introduction is a video from our service on February 21st, 2021, a service where we were joined by a special guest, Elle Dowd. Elle Dowd, pronouns she, her, hers, is a bi-furious recent graduate of the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago and a candidate for urbane ministry in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. She spoke with us today about liberation and abolitionism. In this video, you will hear the reading and the reflection from our service. Following that, we hope that you'll join myself and Elle for a lively discussion where we'd go deeper into the service theme together. You're invited to check out our video or audio podcast each week, posted on our website, Facebook, YouTube, and your favorite podcast streaming sites. We're also uploading them onto Instagram as well. If you like what you see, we hope you'll give us a positive review. Likes, comments, shares, and subscribes help us spread Fourth Universalist media further. Thank you again for watching. We begin with our reading. the book of Isaiah, the 61st chapter. The Spirit of God is upon me because God has anointed me. God has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display God's glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the formal devastation, former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom God has blessed. Good morning. In 2018, I was a part of a direct action at the Cook County Courthouse here in Chicago titled Free the Captives. It was a direct allusion to these verses from Isaiah that were just read today. Words that Jesus quoted later on many years later in his first sermon and inaugural address as a kind of mission statement of sorts letting everyone know what he was all about. The spirit of God is upon me because God has anointed me. God has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. I grew up in the Lutheran church and I was also and probably continue to be the biggest Bible nerd. So I had grown up hearing these verses, but at the time, I didn't really think that the prophet Isaiah or Jesus really meant release the prisoners. Large swaths of the congregation that I grew up in were big into literalism when it came to things like hell or affirming, LGBT, or affirming LGBTQIA plus people. In fact, this congregation I grew up in took their interpretation of scripture so literally, so seriously, that after the ELCA voted in 2009 to ordain and marry LGBTQIA plus people, my congregation left the denomination and then pushed me out for pushing back, even though I wasn't even yet out to them as bisexual. But my 
Bible believing church and my Sunday school teachers never talked to me about proclaiming release for the captives and freedom for prisoners. It felt safer, I guess, especially in our comfortable white suburbs to think of those things as metaphors rather than clear signs of what we call the reign of God. At the action in Chicago in 2018, we chanted the words from these verses as a kind of call and response as we occupied the Cook County Courthouse to demand an end to money bail and unjust pretrial detention. At that time inside the Cook County Jail, there were over 2,500 people who were stuck in jail who had not been convicted of a crime, but were there merely because they were too poor and in most cases too black or too brown to pay their way out. When people are incarcerated pre-trial while they're still supposed to be presumed innocent, they often lose their jobs, which means losing their homes and even sometimes their kids. And it does nothing to actually keep us, the public, safer. Studies show that releasing people pre-trial actually decreases crime. And further, these 2,500 people held pre-trial are people that had been screened even by the criminal justice system's own standards, which are very skewed, as people who were safe for release. All they had to do was pay a ransom of a few thousand dollars. For white and wealthy people, this was usually no problem. It was definitely no problem for Jason Van Dyke, the Chicago police officer who murdered black teenager Laquan McDonald by shooting him 16 times as he walked away from him. And then with the cooperation of his fellow officers and government officials covered up the crime. Officer Jason Van Dyke was released on bail almost immediately when his father and other police officers coughed up cash and paid bail. So Jason Van Dyke was able to sleep at home at night in his bed while awaiting trial for 16 shots and a cover up while 2,500 people lost their rights because they couldn't pay bail. This story is from Chicago, but I know there are similar stories where you live. According to the New York State Department of the budget, New York spends over $3 billion a year on incarceration alone. Money that could be used to prevent crime by getting at the root of problems. Money that could be resources for the community. Money that could go to schools or jobs. And in New York City, the total expenses of the police department was nearly $11 billion in 2020. What could your community have done with $11 billion last year? You may have heard the news that just recently Illinois became the first state to abolish cash bail. This win was thanks to a coalition of organizations across the state who had been working tirelessly for eight years. Now, I was part of that coalition for the last four years. Four years ago, people still thought that abolishing cash bail was a pipe dream, a nice idea. And now, once this new criminal justice bill is rolled out fully, it will be a reality. My tradition, Christianity, includes people that we refer to as prophets. These prophets cast a vision for the way things could be, the way things will be when the reign of God, or you might say a reign of justice, comes in all of its fullness. And Isaiah, the prophet we read today, spoke in line with many of his spiritual ancestors when he said that the reign in the reign of justice, tyrants are cast out, the poor are lifted up, the hungry are fed, and prisoners are released. In the reign of justice, true justice, there are no prisons, there are no more captives. The reign of justice includes a world beyond our prison industrial complex. The reign of justice embraces police and prison abolition. It would be easy to relegate this all to imagery or allegory. But later on, 
when Jesus quoted these abolitionist words from Isaiah, its original hearers did not see it as just mere allegory. They didn't smile and think to themselves, sounds nice, what a beautiful, wonderful utopian image. When Jesus quoted these very same words in a synagogue in his hometown, the people there were angry enough to try to throw him off a cliff. And we know that the Roman Empire took Jesus's words quite seriously. His resistance to the powers of that time eventually got him killed. There are prophets today in our own streets, in our own Twitter news feeds. They come in the tradition of Isaiah and Mary, mother of God, and John the Baptist, and Jesus, and Sojourner Truth, and Ella, Ella Baker, and Fannie Lou Hamer, and so many others. They are casting a vision for the future where our collective liberation isn't just a nice dream. It's a reality. They are telling us the future of a, of a, a story where captives are set free, a future that's coming, a future that's already on its way. It's a true story, a, tr a story that threatens kings and terrifies tyrants. And these prophets all around us in the streets and on our Twitter feeds, they're inviting us to be a part of that future as coworkers instead of obstacles. As we commemorate Black History Month this month, I also invite you to discern what your role in bringing justice to your communities in real tangible ways might look like. Because divine love, justice is calling on you to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to prisoners. I'm really excited to get to sit down with Elle, who is both a colleague and a friend that I have known for quite some time. And it was really wonderful to get to hear her speak uh, to the Fourth U community. Uh, that means a lot to me as well. Uh, and so Elle, since there's only so much time in a service for us to get to introduce you and that paragraph doesn't quite do it justice, would you like to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yes, I would love to. It was so good to be with you all this morning. Like Ember said, my name is Elle. I use pronouns like she, her, and hers. And I grew up in the Midwest, actually. I grew up in Iowa in a suburb of Des Moines, a very white suburb. And so I grew up very much steeped in whiteness um, and had internalized a lot of messages of white supremacy, even though at the time I didn't know that's what it was. Um, and so throughout my life, I was fortunate enough to have people in my life to help broaden my viewpoints and relationships that helped me to see, you know, another world's possible, to recognize some of the things that I had internalized about the dominant narrative, which included white supremacy. Um, and one major thing that formed me in caring about anti-racism and becoming an abolitionist was uh, my daughters. My two daughters are, uh, they're, they're turning 14 and they are from Sierra Leone in West Africa. So I have two black teenagers that are under my care and um, caring about them, loving them and feeling responsible for them really took the experience of learning about anti-racism out of something that was just like this abstract moral idea um, something that lived in my head and into something, you know, very embodied that lived in my gut, right? The sort of thing that, that keeps me up at night. And um, as I, you know, tuck my kids into bed at night and they still sort of let me do that in their own way, I, I have to grapple looking at them at their faces. I have to grapple with the reality of the world that they wake up in and the world that we're leaving for them. Um, I was very formed by my time in St. Louis during the Ferguson uprising in 2014. Black unarmed teenager Michael Brown was shot and killed by white police officer Darren Wilson. And the response from the community, the uprising there ignited a movement and reinvigorated the calls for um, racial justice in this country. And I was fortunate enough to be working for the Episcopal Diocese of Missouri at the time. And my job was with young people. And so the young people were in the streets. And so that's where I was too. And in the streets, I was confronted again with a lot of the things I'd internalized about dominant narratives about 
safety and policing and justice. Um, and through these relationships and through my own experiences, I learned more and eventually became an abolitionist. And now that is one of the things I've dedicated my life to as a faith leader and a community leader is building a world without prisons and policing. For those of our listeners who may not quite know the terminology of uh, abolitionism, could you maybe define abolitionism for us and how that maybe differs from, from more traditional uh, calls for how we confront these problems in our society? Yeah, so many people um, are reformists. They care about reform. So these are people also who um, you know, agree that there's an issue, but, but they have a different way of wanting to deal with the solution. And I was a reformist for sure. I didn't have to be convinced, um, at least at the time that I was in St. Louis, I didn't have to be convinced that there was a problem with our criminal justice system, that there was racism in um, the policing and, and our public safety. But I thought that you know, maybe it was a few individual people causing a problem and that really if we just had more training and we had more cameras and we had more, maybe it would get better. Um, and what I ended up learning was that that isn't true because you can only reform something if it's broken. And the problem with our criminal justice system is that it's been intentionally built this way from the beginning. It's been steeped in white supremacy and classism and all other kinds of forms of oppression. Um, and the problem with reformism is that we tend to you know, expand things like funding. So when we try to uh, give the police more cameras, for example, body cameras, what ends up happening is we increase their funding, which means we increase their reach. And that also means we are increasing, you know, the terror that they inflict on communities of color. And unfortunately, as we've seen, particularly, you know, in the past year and even, and even longer, having something on camera doesn't necessarily stop it from happening um, and doesn't necessarily ensure justice. Um, Eric Garner is another example of, of a death that was caught on camera and, and those police just didn't, were not held accountable. They got to, you know, walk free. So um, what ends up happening with things like reformist measures, such as increased uh, cameras, is that instead of the security being used how it's intended to hold police accountable, what ends up happening is it increases the surveillance of Black activists and liberation workers, which ends up putting people in, in, in jeopardy. Um, we've seen, you know, historically, the ways that the police departments um, have, have made coordinated attacks against black liberation workers. And so it really puts people at risk. And so abolition differs from this framework, this framework of reform. Reform says, this is a system that could be good or is pretty much good, but there's just like some kinks to work out. And abolition says and recognizes, no, this isn't broken. This system that we have now is working exactly as intended. It was built this way on purpose. It's not one or two people, it's entirely systemic. And even good people trapped up in this system doing their jobs can't be good or right or moral because the system itself is so flawed. And so abolition asks us to imagine a better world, imagine a different way forward. I think sometimes people hear the word um, abolition and they just think like that means tomorrow we're just like flinging open all the jail doors and um, then it's just chaos or something, right? Uh, but one of the architects of the abolition movement is Ruth Wilson Gilmore. And she says, abolition is about presence, not absence. So it is about getting rid of some stuff, right? It's about getting rid of prisons and policing. But in, in its wake, right, in, the, in that vacuum, we're not just leaving nothing there. Abolition is about building something. It's about building a future where everyone has what they need to thrive, which is what really you know, reduces crime. The neighborhoods that have the lowest amounts of crime, it's not because they have the most police, it's not because they have the most people in prison, it's because they have the most resources. And so abolition is about healthcare, it's about education, it's about job and living wage and making sure that people have things like art and beauty and love in their lives so that there isn't crime um, and that those root problems are really solved instead of um, just, you know, locking people away. Because as Dr. Angela Davis says, Another architect of the abolition movement, prisons do not disappear problems, they disappear people. 
So those problems, those root causes of crime and violence are still present even when we're locking people up. So you might notice I, I kind of named these two architects of the abolition movement. Abolition has been a movement for, for decades. And so with the recent sort of push to defund, there's been more conversations about abolition in the mainstream, but um, you know, black women in the 60s and even earlier had been talking about police and prison abolition. And so there's been people that, even if this is like new information to us who have been studying this for decades, and there's a lot of really good resources about the particulars. Definitely, I, I definitely can highly recommend Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis. Uh, though I will say, uh, as you named there, that this is work that's been going on and it was actually even more challenging to read this and hear her talk about like, oh, and this happened last year in like the nineties uh, and uh, to, to feel like, oh, wow, it's gotten so much worse since then. Um, you know, it was, it was a little bit of a, of a personal challenge of, wow, this is, this is a, a pretty deep rooted problem. Uh, and, you know, I do find it interesting that, um, you know, there was this sudden interest in it, and it seems like there's also been some level of sudden scapegoating of it, that even though most police departments saw zero decrease in funding, uh, with the pandemic causing a rise in crime due to social inequalities, suddenly people are like, oh, wow, well, this is because of the defund the police people, uh, even when nothing has changed in terms of, of that. Would you like to maybe... For folks who have that sort of gut reaction that, that defunding the police is going to, to ruin everything, instantly rise in crime, you know, would you like to maybe give any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so a big part of, well, I guess I first I should name um, that you already, you already know this, Ember, but not everyone who wants to defund the police is an abolitionist. There are some people who want to sort of shrink the police and not abolish them. Um, but also defunding the police is a key sort of tenet of abolition. So they're overlapping, but not sort of necessarily the exact same thing. Abolitionists want to uh, you know, defund, disarm and disband the police. But this idea that you know, the, the narrative around defunding the police is what is responsible for a rise in crime just doesn't, it's not borne out by the data um, because a big part of defunding the police is not just taking money away from the police, but reinvesting in communities. Again, like we said, um, you know, the safest communities are the ones with the most resources because in the pandemic, people are desperate, they're losing their jobs, healthcare is hard to come by. Um, and so that sort of level of desperation when people don't have their needs met is what causes a rise in crime. And so defunding the police would not only reduce the police influence and reach in terrorizing communities of color, it would also very intentionally put that money in programs that actually prevent crime. So that's what we're looking at. I think, um, you know, in our very, in a white Western point of view, um, in here in the United States, we have a very individualistic idea of how things work, right? We see someone commits a crime and we kind of zoom in and we're like, this person did a bad thing, right? They committed this crime. What abolition does is zooms out and looks at the bigger picture. So it's not that there's no personal responsibility, but there's also a level of communal responsibility. So instead of saying this one bad person did this one bad thing and they deserve to be punished, it says, zooms out and asks the community, why was this person put in this position? How are we all responsible? How can we all respond? And so in that way, it's, it gets at the root issue, it gets at the root cause um, and makes us safer in the long term. Well, you know, that sort of response, uh, I mean, really in many ways does exist for lots of more well-off, well-connected white folks in the United States that, that when something goes wrong, you know, they're, they're not held under bail for, for infinitely forever and they are given a chance to like repent of their sins and, and feel better uh, about things. So, you know, it's, it's a framework that does exist already in parts of our society. It just needs to be applied, applied broader. So as, as a spiritual community, uh, and with you as a, as a faith leader, what wisdom do you have for how spiritual communities can be involved in this liberation and abolition work? Yes, spiritual communities have really something special to offer liberation and abolitionist work because uh, as you know, from being a part of one, spiritual communities are really special places. They are some of the few spaces in our society that can be truly intergenerational where we can have older folks and younger folks and all kinds of folks gathered together. 
regularly. So in community organizing, um, we look at that and we're like, whoa, that's a ready-made base. That's not something that's true of most communities, right? Where we're all gathering regularly, people from all walks of life, um, and we gather regularly together and we're in relationship with one another. We're a community. And in gathering, spiritual communities are gathered around um, common values. So they, we all, like spiritual communities already have something in common. So for, for you all, um, it's those things that you, you know, say in your opening and closing, like lighting of the, uh, the torch, right? It's like all of these things, all of these values that we say, like, this is what we're about. There's already this community that is regularly gathering around these shared values across generations, across backgrounds. And so within that, that means that you all have parents and aunties and you also have um, social workers maybe and teachers maybe maybe you have doctors maybe you have um, legal aids within this community you have people that have varied different gifts and expertise and passion to offer to the movement and so that in itself is a huge gift for liberation uh, movements but something that you all have collectively also as a community in addition to all those individual roles that you can all play as a community, spiritual communities are very special in the work of abolition because we are stewards of spiritual imagination. And what that means is we've sort of decided that we have some sort of hope for something better coming um, and that we can believe in that even when it feels really difficult, like even when we have doubts, we have sort of committed to a better future. Um, and that means imagining what that's like. And so that's sort of like the proprietary thing that spiritual communities offer, you know, social workers in the age to come where there's total liberation, social workers are going to do their social work thing, teachers are going to educate, communicators are going to communicate, and spiritual communities can be stewards of spiritual imagination, helping us to believe in what might be possible, telling our stories together and imagining the world to come. Wow, uh, I think that that is a beautiful place for us to, to end our little bit of a deeper dive into, into the themes of the service. So Elle, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Elle, where could people find out a little bit more about you and your journey? Yeah, so you can always get in touch with me at my website, ldow.com. Um, at my website right now too, there's a pop-up that you can order the book if you're interested. It's available for pre-order right now um, on IndieBound, so independent bookstores, but also Barnes & Noble, Amazon, and directly through the publisher, which is Broadleaf Books. You can also find me at Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat at the handle HowNowBrownDowd. And you can find me on TikTok. Um, my handle there is LDowd Ministry or on Facebook.com slash LDowd Ministry. Thanks so much, Elle. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.